say, well, what does that mean to go and make disciples? And it's real easy with Aaron and Jenna because we see they're going to Nepal and India with starting Bible colleges and pastoral ministries and planning churches in these little villages. I mean, to us, yeah, that's going and making disciples. Now, in this room, probably none of us will be doing that, going to Nepal and India and starting Bible colleges. So how do we, as Christians in Savannah, Georgia, go and make disciples? Well, I think we need to ask a couple things first. And tonight I'm actually going to be asking a lot of questions. And um, I really would like this study to be um, kind of re a reflective study. Um, you know, asking the questions. Maybe you can ask yourself that. If you take notes, maybe write down the questions or write down your answers. Um, kind of after the fact, even if you'd like to, um, I encourage you to, to go and, and ask other people to see what they think. Um, so the first question I have, and I think we need to have, is what is discipling? What is a disciple? Well, first off, a disciple, as Merriam-Webster puts it, is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another. Which I think, as if you're a Christian here tonight, then I think we all kind of understand that. That if you're a disciple, you're one who accepts what a teacher is teaching, and you're also assisting in spreading what that teacher is teaching to others. A disciple. And so a disciple isn't inherently just a Christian word. Oh, if you're a Christian, you're a disciple. Now that might be true, but you can be a disciple and not be a Christian. You can be a disciple for someone else, for something else. Now what is, the, what is discipling? Well, to, if that's even a word. I don't know if that's a word, to be honest. But to disciple, the verb to disciple, means to teach or to train. So discipling, basically, is training someone to accept and assist in spreading doctrine, God's doctrine, His word, to others. That you've accepted it, and now you assist in spreading it. So we've got that down. What is discipling? What is a disciple? The next question I had to ask myself was, why do we disciple? Why do we disciple? And real quick, I need to turn my phone off because it's about to go off, I think. The Hawk, it's Stanley Cup Finals tonight. And <laughs> I get all the updates. So why do we disciple? Well, if you were here a couple weeks ago with Aaron, then you know that it's because of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, when Jesus gives the great commission to go out into all the nations, baptizing them and making disciples. It's a commandment. Now, when we hear the word commandment, when you hear the word Ten Commandments, I think a lot of people see that and say, well, that's a burden. Or in this case, when Jesus says to go and make disciples, we can view that as a burden. It's a task. It's something I have to do, a chore. You know, like when growing up, your parents would go tell you to clean your room, sweep the kitchen, do the dishes. That was a commandment from your parents to go do those things. And so now Jesus is telling us to go and make disciples. And to us, that's a burden. That's a task, a chore. And, uh, you know, I got all these other things in my life that I have to do, Jesus. Don't you understand? I got kids. I have a job. I have a family. I have a hobby. Making disciples, I don't know if I have time for that. Or I'll make time for that. Or I'll set aside a specific time to make disciples. But in reality, if we ourselves are disciples, it's not really a burden, but it's a natural desire of Christ's disciples to make disciples. Now really, the sweetest fruit of a disciple is that they go and make more disciples. So tonight, we're going to look at three guys. We're going to look at really this relationship or this equation if I may, in action in the Bible of a disciple making a disciple making a disciple. We're going to look at three people, Barnabas, Paul, and Timothy. And uh, most of you who know your Bible or, or the book of Acts know those three guys, Barnabas, Paul, and Timothy. They're very prevalent in the New Testament and uh, actually... Uh, where we are in Acts, we're about to get into Barnabas and Paul this Sunday. 
But this, to this evening, if you're already there, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 26, let's read this section. It says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Now, quick caveat, you might be saying, I said Paul, and now we're reading Saul. Saul is Paul. He's going to later change his name. Right now, he's being called Saul, so I don't want you to get confused thinking we're talking about two different people. Saul is Paul, so there's that. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, within these few verses, we see kind of a, a story unfold before us. First is that Saul went to Jerusalem, and they shunned him. They didn't believe he was a disciple. They didn't believe he got saved. Previously in the chapter, um, Saul, Paul, had gotten saved on the road to Damascus. Jesus actually blinded him, you know, showed up. He was blinded and, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because at that time, he was locking Christians up, and, and many believe even murdering Christians. But he was saved, but most of the people didn't believe so, because to the Christians, he was basically ISIS, the leader of ISIS in their day. So now he's walking into their church and, and saying, hey guys, I'm a disciple, and they're saying, no way. <laughs> That's not possible. So he gets there, he's alone, he's shunned. But we see in verse 27, it says, But, even though they didn't believe and he was shunned, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. We see that Barnabas reached out. Barnabas was the first person to really accept Paul as a disciple, see something in Paul that, hey, no, he has changed because he's not trying to kill us or lock us up right now. Barnabas reached out. And this is one of the most important things about discipling, especially something I've learned in my own life, is that when we disciple, we don't just sit back and wait for the, the disciples to come to us. No, we go and we reach out. Because how did Jesus call his disciples? Did he sit on top of a mountain and just people just started coming to him saying, I want to be your disciple, I want to be your disciple. No, he just was walking around and he said, come follow me, you. I want you to come follow me, you. I want you to come follow me. He reached out to these people where they were. Maybe he could, you know, he could, obviously Jesus, we're not Jesus, so we, we don't know everything, but... Jesus reached out to them. Barnabas, in this situation, saw Paul shunned and alone, and he reached out to him. He didn't wait and say, well, do you want to be a disciple? No, he reached, put his arm around him and said, come on in. I want to, I'll help you get through this. I'll introduce you. I, I know some of the guys there in Jerusalem. I'll introduce you. You can give your testimony, share your story of how you now are a disciple, and, and we'll go from there. So Barnabas reached out. Again, one of the very, probably one of the most important things we can do if we want to disciple people is to reach out. Now for Barnabas, this would have been very vulnerable. Because again, had Saul not really been a disciple, he could have been arrested. Ha, gotcha. I tricked you. Now you're going to jail. Or worse, he could have been killed. So Barnabas was taking a great chance by saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to this guy. I want to see him grow. We see that it ended up working well, and most of us know the story after that. Paul writes most of the New Testament. But anyways, he declares to them how he had, it says in verse 27, how he had seen the Lord on the road and he had spoken 
to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And then in verse 28, so awesome. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Before he was shunned and alone, Barnabas reaches out to him and says, Hey, I want to bring you in. I want to disciple you. He shares his testimony. They see the difference. And now he's coming in. He's going out. He's one of them now. He's found a home. He's found a family. A group of people that want to invest in him, that want to love on him. And that really, that encourage him. I mean, think about our homes, just in our regular homes. The place we call home. It's a place where we go to rest, to be refreshed, to be encouraged. It's where our fridge is at. Hey, if we're hungry, we know we can always go. Hopefully, we know we can always go to the fridge and, and get something out. Got that bed, that sofa, that lazy boy chair that sits in the corner. And Paul has, for this moment, has found that. He's coming in. He's going out. He's being encouraged. He's preaching the name of, the, of Jesus boldly. And we see it all started because Barnabas reached out. Now, the next section of Scripture we're going to look at tonight is Acts 11, verse 25 and 26. Actually, we're going to go over this as well this next Sunday morning, um, but we're kind of uh, getting a sneak peek. Acts 11 Verses uh, 25 and 26 says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And we had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it, was that, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Again, we see Barnabas seeking Saul out. The church in Jerusalem had sent Barnabas out at this point. Saul had not been in Jerusalem anymore. And so he's in the area, and then he goes to Tarsus to seek Saul out. Maybe see how he's doing. Maybe, um, you know, he knows, hey, Saul's a great teacher. He really knows the law because he was a Pharisee before he got saved. I want to I bring him in. And so, he's, again, we see him seeking out Saul. This time, Saul was just Saul, a Christian. He wasn't the Apostle Paul, as he'll later be called in, in the New Testament letters. No, he's just some guy named Saul living in Tarsus as a Christian. So we, again, we see Barnabas seeking out Saul. And, and it says here that they taught. They taught. So for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What they did was they taught and they made more disciples. They taught the word. They taught what they had been taught. Saul and Barnabas taught what they had been taught by the Lord, what they knew from the word. And they were just sharing it with others. This is what I have learned, and so I'm going to impart that wisdom to you. Just like if you're a parent, you do with your own children. Maybe it's through warning. Hey, don't do that because I was your age once and I did that. And trust me, it's not good. It won't end up well for you. Chuck Smith, um, the founder of Calvary Chapel, used to always say that God is not into addition. He's into multiplication. And when you think of it like addition, you think of it, I think of at least a horizontal line. We're just adding and adding and adding, just one at a time, one at a time. But multiplication is more like a family tree where one person begets two, and they each beget two, and, they each be, and it just goes on and on, and it's multiplying rather than just a straight line. It's like a big family tree. We do that. Making disciples is doing that. The next section of Scripture, if you want to turn with me, you can. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 1, says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with them, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was Greek. 
And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So now we have the next relationship. We had Barnabas and Saul, Paul, and now we see it's Paul in Acts chapter 16. His name's already been changed. He's Paul, and now Paul and Timothy. First, we see about Timothy that he's well spoken of. And that because of that, Paul desires for, to have him go on with him. At this time, Paul was on a missionary journey. Um, he was really traveling all throughout the world. And he, he comes to Lystra, Derby and Lystra, and he sees this young man, Timothy, who's well spoken of, doing great things for the Lord. Um, but it doesn't seem that he has a spiritual father. Someone to take him... to to take him under their wing, to teach him. In fact, throughout the New Testament, Paul will actually refer to himself as a father to, to many people and actually refers to Timothy a few times as his son, spiritual son. What we're told about Timothy's actual father is that he was Greek. We're not told whether or not he was saved or anything. I'm not going to say he was or wasn't. But it doesn't seem like he had anyone really mentoring him, anyone really discipling him, showing him the way to go, um, how to use the gifts that he had. So as Paul saw with Barnabas, Paul now does with Timothy. And what does Paul do? He reaches out. He wants Timothy to come with him. Then we see what Paul does once he does that. Which is, you know, for some of us, like, well, I wouldn't do that. But in verse 3, it says, Paul wanted him to have go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in that region. Paul taught him. Paul was teaching him. Throughout Paul's epistles that he writes to the different churches um, in the area of, those, of that time, he talks about love. He talks about reaching out to people. He talks about how if you want to get the gospel to people, you can't just be offensive. It says, to the Greeks I became Greeks, to the Jews, Jews, to the barbarians, bar barbaric. I become all things to all people that I might reach some for Christ. He also talks about not stumbling brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, if I'm eating meat that was sacrificed to idols and a, a weaker brother sees me in the Lord and he says, hey, I can sacrifice to idols. I saw Paul eating some meat sacrificed to idols. Paul said, I'll never eat meat again. I'll be a vegan the rest of my life. That's Paul's words, not mine. But Paul was teaching Timothy, look, if we're going to reach these Jews, Timothy, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to give up some of your rights. You're going to have to be circumcised. Not an easy thing. And I'll leave it at that. And so Paul circumcised them and they go to the Jews in that region and, and they were able to deliver, and it says in verse 4, and they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. Now, what that verse is referring to is previously in Acts chapter 15, um, the church in Jerusalem didn't know what to do with the believing Gentiles because they're like, do they need to keep the law, the commandments of Moses, or can they just eat and do whatever they want? Well, they kind of came down to some ground rules or, or some um, uh, encouragements. Hey, stay away from things you know, that have blood in them and, and you know, just uh, keep yourselves sexually pure and, and stay away from idols. And, and other than that, as long as you believe in Jesus Christ. And so that's what they're talking about. They're giving them the gospel. And so in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 17, Paul actually tells the Corinthians that Timothy is coming to them Right before in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, Imitate me, and now I'm sending to you Timothy to remind you of the ways you're supposed to act in Christ. So Paul had taught Timothy, and now Tim he's saying, Timothy, now I want you to go out and tell others how you're supposed to be a Christian, how you're supposed to act. Give them the gospel. Give them the word of God, the decrees that have been given to us. Give them that.
And then at the close of 1 Timothy, which was written by Paul to Timothy later on, Paul encourages Timothy to guard what was committed to his trust. That thing that was committed to his trust was the Word of God. To simply teach the Word of God. Don't go after all these fables, these stories, these genealogies that people are bringing up. Just stick to the Word of God. Don't worry about entertaining people or boring people to death with all the knowledge you have either. (laughs) But simply teach the Word of God. Now, Timothy is, is always with Paul, what we see. Timothy's actually mentioned in the book of Romans. He's mentioned in 1 and 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Philemon, which were all written by Paul, and then Hebrews, which many believe was written by Paul. Whether it was Timothy's at the beginning greeting, hey, this is Paul and Timothy writing to you, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy writing to you, or in, you know, admonishing Timothy, hey, Timothy's a great guy, or I'm sending him to you, or, or you need to listen to Timothy, look at Timothy. And obviously, First and Second Timothy, Timothy's in, which was written by Paul because it was written to him. <laughs> but Paul was a true disciple maker. He could say, as he did in... in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. That right there is what disciple making is. Hey, Jesus is my disciple. I'm imitating, or or, Jesus, I'm Jesus' disciple. I'm just imitating him. And now you're my disciple. And if I'm imitating Christ, then you can imitate me because I'm just doing what Christ has said. Now, to see the fruit of Paul, let's go to 1 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 4. And um, this is the last place we're turning this evening. But 1 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 4. Again, this is the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. We see Paul is writing this to Timothy as he says in verse 2, he's a true son in the faith. Now that word true means loyal and sincere son. Basically that he's mature. Now Timothy is still a young man at this time. Timothy was probably in his early 20s. He's in his 20s at some point. But he's also the pastor there at Ephesus. The head pastor, the lead pastor. Now I can obviously relate to this. (laughs) Being, Being a pastor of a congregation and having your, uh, your mentor write to you, or, I mean, we're in 2018, so I just called my old pastor not too long ago, <laughs> a couple hours ago. <laughs> so we, doesn't have to, we don't have to write to each other, we can just, uh, I guess we text every now and then, that's like writing. <laughs> but um, Paul is writing to Timothy, encouraging Timothy, look, continue doing what you're doing, stay at Ephesus, they need you there encourage them just to teach the word. Don't worry about these other things. But just teach the word, Timothy. And what Paul was encouraging Timothy to do here is to make more disciples. It all started with Barnabas just reaching out. Saying, you know what? I, there's something different with this Saul guy. I want to I hear his story. And Barnabas reaches out to Saul. And then Saul Paul reaches out to Timothy, and now Timothy leads a church there in Ephesus. In fact, the the church of Ephesus is mentioned there in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 when uh, Jesus is speaking to the churches. And and Jesus has a lot of good things to say about the church of Ephesus. The one bad thing he does have to say is that they left their first love, speaking of Jesus. Jesus. But needless to say, Timothy was a good pastor, a good disciple maker. Because Paul, we see in his letters, is just urging Timothy to just continue doing what you've been doing. 
continue imitating me. What did Paul do? He made disciples. Timothy wasn't Paul's only disciple either. It wasn't, all right, I made Timothy. All right, good, I'm retirement now from disciple making. There were many people that Paul discipled. And so this evening, as we think about discipleship, talk about discipleship, I have some questions I think um, we should ask ourselves. And I would encourage you, um, after this, we've got desserts. You know, like I said, desserts and discipleship. I didn't forget the desserts part. <laughs> but maybe ask each other as we're fellowshipping, talking. Maybe you can, you know, I mean, to, to get honest with each other about this. But the first question is, have you been discipled? Have you been discipled before? Not have you been saved, not have you been part of a church, but have you been discipled? Have you had someone over you kind of as a mentor, a father, a mother in the faith, teaching you the, the, the way that you should go? And then whatever the answer is to that question, the next question should be, are you being discipled right now? I don't think there's any of us that should not be being discipled. Whether you've been a Christian for 30 years or you're a, an elder or a pastor or whatever, we should all be, be being discipled. I should go back to school. <laughs> the next question you might want to ask, your, you should ask yourself is, are you discipling anyone? Do you have anyone that you're pouring into mentoring it doesn't have to be an official title. I, they're my disciple. I'm their discipler. But do you have anyone that you're pouring into? Whether they're younger than you, older than you, the same age as you? Are you pouring into anyone? Or are you just getting fat off of everyone else and not sharing? If no, why not? Why aren't you discipling anyone? Jesus has commanded us to go and make disciples. That commandment's for every believer. Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just a barely new Christian. Jesus doesn't say, go and make disciples after you know, your three-year probationary Christian period, you know, after that. I mean, you, if you're saved this evening, you have a testimony you can share with others. Just as the blind man did when Jesus healed him. And the Pharisees asked, what happened? <laughs> oh, I was blind and now I see. Boom, he's there trying to make disciples. He's there trying to give vision to the blind. So if no, why not? What's stopping you? Maybe you're afraid to reach out. It's, it's just as simple as, hey, you want to go get coffee? Okay. You want to come over for dinner? Okay. Hey, I'm going out doing this. Do you want to come with me? I remember when I was in, uh, the youth, uh, was in youth ministry, I loved to go thrift shopping. And so I would just call the kids up and be like, hey, I'm going to go to Goodwill. You want to come? Yeah. And they'd freak out and we go to Goodwill. And I usually buy them a shirt and their parents would be mad at me. I don't want them to wear that shirt. No. You weren't there to say no. Sorry. You can return it. It's Goodwill. You just got to <laughs> donate it. The simple things like that. Uh, Brittany, Brittany with uh, a lot of the younger girls in the youth group, she'd be like, hey, I have to go grocery shopping. You want to come with me? Yeah. Grocery shopping. Brittany asked me if I wanted, no, no, thank you. <laughs> it's very simple to disciple, I think. Lots of ways. We, again, we kind of look at this like, well, we need to sit down. Um, I, I remember my, my pastor, uh, Mark Galvin out there in uh, California, I don't think ever once we like sat down and were like, all right, let's go over this book of the Bible and let's read it. And I want you to understand the Greek and I want you to understand this and I want you to write a five-page essay on why Paul said that. I was just at his house a lot and I just watched how he lived. And when I would kind of step out of line, he'd bring me back in. Or I could come to him anytime with a question and he encouraged me or give me the question. He convict me. Hey, you shouldn't be doing that should be doing this. But it wasn't like this, okay, we, you know, it, this class that we had to take. 
Again, it was just hanging out for the most part. As Paul did with Timothy, he brought him along with him. Hey, I'm going around the world to share Christ. You want to come with me? Yeah. Next question to ask ourselves is how can you be a better disciple? How can you do, do, whether you have someone discipling you or not, how can you be a better disciple? I can't answer that for you. I can't even give you options. That's something you're going to have to sit down with the Lord and ask. The next question is, how can you be a better disciple maker? Maybe it is reaching out, trusting in the Lord. And lastly, in, in if, you ask, if you've asked yourself and maybe others all these questions, how can we help? We as the church, we as one another, how can we help you? I mean, I, I see you know, people in this room, we all can help one another. Be a better disciple, be a better disciple maker. Maybe you're looking to be a disciple. Maybe you're looking to be a disciple maker. There's, as Jesus said, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. So this evening, I encourage you to do what Christ has commanded us to do and to make disciples. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this evening. And Lord, just that you've given us an example to follow, Lord. And you didn't just say follow it, Lord, but you've given us your Holy Spirit so that way we have the ability to because in and of ourselves, we can do nothing. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we can do anything that you've called us to do. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be disciples and we would be disciple makers. And, Lord, if there's things in our life that we can make us better at that, I pray you would show us. That we would be not just into addition, but into multiplication of making disciples, making mature believers. I just pray, Lord, you would also bless these Amazing desserts to our body as we go into a sugar coma. It's in your name we pray. Amen.